Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. go here we are with episode number 56 of the principles of performance podcast i am your host eric degatti along with my friend mike perry mike welcome to the episode it's good to be it's good to be back once again um you know today's guest uh it's it's my world today i'm pretty excited so uh, i'm gonna let you finish up but uh it's a it's a rainy day here in boston big surprise but that's okay because uh it is what it is, but I'm uh, man. I'm excited about today's uh, today's guest. I can't wait to talk shop with with this gentleman. So uh, I'm going to let you finish up, and and I'm looking forward to today. Well, I- I'm excited as well, but I'm going to take a little, probably a little bit more of a backseat on this one. And I guess this makes up for all the baseball specific guys I've been getting lately. Um, yeah. So now we're going to get we got a fight guy. We got nobody better. So kind of a cool story I'll get to in a minute. But today we have George Lockhart, and uh, he's a former Marine who's now considered one of the foremost experts on on weight cutting performance nutrition and weight management uh in addition to working with some of the biggest names in combat sports george along with his partner dan leith uh become one of the some of the most respected teachers in the space and they have a great course called the weight cutting uh, specialist course uh they've worked with everybody you can think of top level fighters conor mcgregor george st pierre daniel cormier uh triple g you name it plus other celebrities they've worked with um, and kind of a cool story of how, how we got to this is George actually came up to my facility. We we're just trying to figure out before we, we hit the record button, pro- I'm going to guess maybe 15 years ago when he was actually still actively fighting and then just kind of kept in touch through social media. And then, you know, a bunch of years later, uh, I have one of the kids that I train is a huge McGregor fan and he's sharing a bunch of videos with me on him. And I'm like, wait a second, that dude looks familiar. I'm like, is that George? And I'm like, holy shit, that's George. And I reached out and and we kind of kept in touch. As soon as we started the podcast and we made our kind of wish list of who we wanted to have on, George, you were right on there. So George, welcome. Awesome. It's been a minute. Good seeing you, man. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm excited. It, it has been a, a bit of journey, uh, but I'm so glad we connected back in the day, man. You guys were so helpful. And, uh, you know, I never told you, I applied a lot of the stuff that I learned from you in the Marine Corps. I was actually... Uh, combat conditioning instructor training for the Marine Corps. And um, I applied a lot of principles that you guys gave me. So for that, thanks. And uh, thanks again for having me on your show. That's awesome. So uh, well, we, I'll wait for my check from the U.S. government any day now. But uh, so you've had an interesting <laughs> journey, man. You, you might be you waiting got, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you've had an interesting journey, man. So I went from, you know, you were just coming out of the Marines and you were you had a successful career as a combat athlete yourself. And then you know, all these years later, you're like the big name in, in MMA with nutrition. Kind of walk us through the steps. Tell us what we what we missed. Well, I, I found out that I was better at cutting weight than I was at fighting. So I uh, just kind of got drifted into that. Um, one of the guys that I was in the Marine Corps with was uh, Brian Stan. Uh, Brian Stan was a, was a very well-known MMA fighter. He was an announcer for the USC for a long period of time as well. And um, he was a WC world champion, and uh, he did very well. But uh, when the UFC bought out the WC, he was fighting opponents at 205 that they just they just had reach on him. You know, I was just making fun of him because you know he's built like a T Rex, he had a huge head and you're like really short arms. But um, I told him I was like, bro, you know, if you went to 185, you dominate. And uh, he's like, if you take control of it, so I did. I took control of it and. Uh, he had a smooth cut, did really well. He actually got fight of the night that, that, uh, against uh, Jorge. I forgot his last name. But um, he, he, did a great, he did a great job. And so we just kind of made it a, a, a continual thing. So the next fight, he, uh, he said, dude, do you think you can help my, uh, my, my training partner out? 
And I was like, sure, absolutely. And then you know, brings me into the room. He's like, hello, this is you know, this is John Jones. This is George. And uh, John, you know, obviously wasn't the name he is today. And I uh, started helping him with the cuts, and he went through Greg Jackson. There's just name after name, and everybody started coming to me, and it just kind of spread like that. And you know, next thing I know, I'm, I'm working with just about every UFC fighter that uh, that's out there. That is awesome. So uh, before we get into like nutrition, really specific to fighters and, and let you and Mike geek out on that, how much of what you practice and teach can actually be applied to like the general fitness enthusiast? And, and when is that applicable? Yeah, I mean, I, my, my philosophy is really simple. It's like give the body what it needs when you need it. Um, you know, when you're, when you're anaerobic, your body's primary source of fuel is going to be carbohydrates. When you're aerobic, your body's primary source of fuel is going to be fat. You know, there's always a mixture of, of uh, macronutrients that your body's using, but whatever activity that you're doing is going to determine a lot of what your body's using. And that's how you have, you know, that's how you have to feed the body. You have to prep the body, you have to feed the body for that. So if you're a combat sports athlete, obviously you're going to be burning a lot more carbohydrates. If you uh, have a more sedentary life, you know, you don't need those carbs. You know, carbs aren't the enemy, but if you don't need them, they are the enemy. You know what I'm saying? You give your body something it doesn't need. I think that's what a lot of people have a bad perception of it. But to, to answer your question, the philosophy works for everybody. People that are diabetic, people that are, you know, uh, sedentaries, people that are active, you know, that aren't combat sports athletes, people that are elite athletes. It, you know, it starts from the bottom, works way up. And they, you know, I, I feel that these principles hold true for everyone. Interesting. So, uh, you know, I, my mind is I'm looking ahead, but I'm thinking right now. So, uh, you know, one of the things you mentioned <laughs> carbohydrates, uh, you know, I, I feel like for some reason, um, for a lot of individuals, and I don't know if it was a keto trend, because I had a lot of fighters that were asking me about keto. And I was like, dude, that's the worst idea ever. You you compete in an anaerobic sport in which, you know, stored blood sugar is your primary fuel. And you're telling me you want to take that away. Like, I don't think that's a good idea. But there was this big trend that was helping people cut weight. And it'll help you cut yeah. weight, but it, it won't help you cut weight and perform at a high level. And that's something that people don't understand. And and, and you did such a great job with clarif clarifying the importance of carbs because it's like, yeah, if you eat a loaf of bread before you go to bed and you sit on the couch <laughs> all day, like, yeah, carbs are bad. But at the same time, it's like, you know what? Like I've had clients that I'm just like, dude, I need you to go like before training. I need you to go eat two bagels. Why? Because, you know, not before training, but, you know, hours before like bagels, bagels are Bro. bad. I'm like, no, 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 dude. Bagels aren't bad. I'm like, bagels are your best friend. Bagels are your best friend because you've got your carbs. But it's so weird because people assume that it's like junk food. And it's like, no, 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 man. Like, you need to understand that you are fueling for, for performance and not just to satiate yourself. It's a different, it's a very, very different mindset. And I tell you what, man, weight, cutting weight and, and all that stuff, working with fighters, as you know, those guys are nuts and gals are nuts to begin with. And then you make them, you know, you get them to the point where if they have a bad <laughs> cut, then you're dealing with some grumpy people, as you know, especially during the bad cuts. But let me, let me ask oh, you bro. this, let me ask you this, right? So, Obviously, you know, weight, weight manipulation has been around for a very, very long time, but I think the average person doesn't really understand what goes into it, but also they don't, don't understand the repercussions because like, look, we've seen, and you've, it's probably happened to a fighter that, you know, or maybe you've worked with, they can have a decent cut and all of a sudden their body shuts down, like their kidneys don't work or something like that. So what are some other sort of things that you really have to pay attention to during the weight cut from an overall health standpoint? Oh man, so <laughs> yeah, you talk about crazy cuts. I, I've seen them all. Um, it is it is a part of the sport, you know. It's not something that I promote. It's it's one of those things like um, when you do it, people automatically think that you're like, oh yeah, you want people to cut a lot of weight. No, I think it's an unnecessary evil, and unfortunately, it's uh, one of those evils that doesn't come into play until it's like. The fighter's like, oh, I, I can't do this. Now I need, need, need to give you a call. You know, I've got guys that were 30 pounds over three days out, you know, and there's not, you know, people are like, that's not healthy. I, I'm like, yes, that is not healthy at all. But either I go and do it and I monitor this in the, in the best way that I possibly can, or they're going to try and do it themselves. Um, you know, one one of the biggest things, and these, these are, you know, if, if fighters are watching this, these are big things that you have to really look at. The two, the two big ones, obviously, dehydration and overheating. A lot of people don't, they don't actually realize the overheating aspect. 
if you sit in a bath too long, the bath is there to create a stimulus. And a lot of times when I have people cut weight or I've seen people in the past cut weight, number one, they never monitored the, the actual temperature of the bath. They never had a thermometer there to actually monitor how hot the bath was. So what they would do is they'd stick their hand in the bath and they'd be like, oh, that's, that's fine. You know, and they'd get as hot as the pot could. And I told them, I was like, have you guys ever put your hand in a pool, like a cold pool? And you're like, oh, that's not too bad. And then you jump in the pool. It's a completely different experience. Um, when, when you put an entire fighter's body, a lot of these guys were actually cooking the fire. Anything above 113 degrees, you're literally, you're cooking your fire. You're going to start burning. Um, they'll actually get burns and so on and so forth. And I've seen people do that. Um, another thing that, that, that I've noticed is that a lot of times they, they look at the, the, the heat as the, the, the outcome that is creating the sweat. It's the stimulus that creates the sweat. But once the stimulus is created, then you get out. You wrap them up and you let them cool down. You let them cool like cool air. You let them relax. You elevate their feet. And one thing you got to realize is that when you're dropping that much weight, the osmolality of, of your body has dropped so much that you, like your blood pressure drops. You're going to you, you have a big possibility of passing out. It's, uh, it's almost inevitable, especially if you're dropping 30 pounds. You're dropping that much sodium. You're dropping that much water. So monitoring the blood pressure during the weight cut is extremely important. You have bar receptors in your body that, that, that actually regulate this. And if, you're, if your heart rate increases 20 points or your blood pressure decreases more than 20 points in a very quick amount of time, if that fighter stands up, they're, they're going out. And these are things that I want fighters to know because um, a fighter is a fighter for a reason. If you ask a fighter how you feel, they're always going to be like, I feel great. You know, they're always going to want to stand up and they're going to start walking. You know, when you get out of a bath, you get out of a sauna, you, you have five seconds to sit up, five seconds to stand, five seconds to step. And you have to have somebody with you at all freaking times to, to, to monitor this. And I've seen, I've seen fighters pass out. We've seen it in the UFC, fights be canceled because these guys pass out, they hit their heads. Um, so, you know, you talk about, you know, we're talking stuff outside of like long, long term. I'm talking like relatively that day. Um, Overheating. Once a fighter overheats, that that cut is over. Uh, you stick a fighter, you stick a fighter into a, a bath for too long at too high a temperature. He could have possibly made the weight, but once that core temperature gets too high, they're not, what's going to happen is they're going to start dry heating. The body overheats. They pull them out. You get a hot weather injury, and that's going to affect them for the rest of their life. You know, they, you put them in any heat, they're going to they're going to get those symptoms. They're going to get nauseous. They're going to feel like fainting. Um, so that's, that's a lot of things that we, we would meant, uh, we, we had specific times that we put people in basically like, you know, just, just a real quick protocol. What we do is we put a, a fighter into a bath at 106 degrees. Um, when, once we put them in, the actual temperature of the bath drops because the heat of the fighter drops the, the weight. So if you put it in at 106, the fighter gets in, it will drop it to about 104, which is the exact same temperature as a jacuzzi. Okay. Now, we remember, we're just there to create a stimulus. So at that point, we would we'd increase, we'd, we'd start a timer. So let's say they're in the 104, and it took them five minutes to um, to start sweating. Once they start sweating, or we call it break a sweat, once they crack, then we start a timer again, and then we'd increase the temperature of the water maybe to 106 or 107, depending on how fast they sweat. Now, if it takes them 10 minutes, that means that we have to create a greater stimulus. So we might go to 108 to 109. And any time we would do would be 50 minutes total. That's it, 50 minutes after they crack. Um, unfortunately, it's, a, it's, a net, it's, it's like a downward spiral because the longer it takes you to crack, let's say it takes you 13 minutes to crack. Obviously, you're more dehydrated, but we have to increase the temperature more because your body, you know, and I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but your body, you know, it's, it's a survival mechanism. You know, if you go out into the, the heat, the body's like, you know, what's going to, oh, we're going to overheat. So what does it do? It starts sweating, right? Well, once you start sweating, your body's like, wait a minute, we're not getting any water back in. What am I more thought of dying from, overheating or dehydration? And unfortunately, that, that triage effect takes place. And once your body's like, oh, it's not getting water, but then, you have, to, you have to make the, the threat of heat become greater than the actual threat of dehydration, but you have to know how long to do that for, so again, so they don't overheat. And then you got to look, obviously, at the dehydration. Once they start losing, feeling like in fingers and limbs and things of that nature, you have to take specific precautions. Um, but 
you know, there's, and like I said, those are like the short term, those are the right there, the things that you need to look out for long term, obviously, kidney damage, joint damage, like it affects your joints like none other. You cut weight and any piece, like it, um, I, I've had so, so many people. Um, and unfortunately, uh, and I've seen this a lot with the women, um, the weight gain is, is drastic. Because you, you deprive your body, your body, like I said, is survival mechanism. You you deprive your body for a long period of time. You start your body of body, you start your body of food, and then when you start eating regularly again, your body's just like I'm holding on to everything. And um, I think that that creates a really big yo-yo effect with a lot of these fighters. And unfortunately, fight camp doesn't become about being a better fighter; it becomes about making weight. Uh, yeah, that, that is that is incredibly wild stuff that that obviously the average person should never put themselves through and obviously even the athletes if you if you can avoid it so let's let's backtrack like where do you even start so someone comes to you for coaching like what are maybe some of the key metrics that you look for or key questions that you ask them to kind of help set up your program and game plan so you know when i first started out you know i <laughs> i'm a marine so we live by keep it simple stupid and, um, you know, I did get a little technical. It's like, we need, we need these tests and these tests and these tests. And now I don't, I don't get tests. I, I'm not saying I'm against tests or anything like blood work or anything of that nature. But if you get specific tests at specific times, like let's say you get your blood pressure tested three different times a day, you're going to get three different outcomes. Same thing with deficiencies, so on and so forth. And people, what they do is they create a program around these tests. What I want to do is I want to create a, a program around the individual's body type, body weight, goals, and activity level. Once I do that, and I'm giving the body what it needs, what it needs is, and there's a deficiency at that point in juncture in time, we can we, we create uh, we create changes. I think a lot of nutritionists nowadays, you know, because obviously, you know, I'm not I'm not I'm not talking bad about nutritionists because you don't go to school to be a nutritionist to be like, yeah, we're gonna drop 30 pounds in three days. Uh, they, they, they look for a healthy lifestyle. But I look at, I tell people, like, I think you're like vehicles. You know, you're getting ready for a fight, so you're like a vehicle, like a car. You're going to drive the car more because you're getting ready for the fight. Now, a calorie is a measurement of energy. So if I take calories away from you, I'm taking energy away from you, and I'm going to drive you more. That's like putting less fuel in a car, driving it harder, and expecting performance to increase. It's impossible. So the principle that I live is that we come up with a baseline, okay? They might gain, gain, and then boom, okay, this is this is where they're, they're, they're staying even. I want to stay at that caloric intake the entire fight camp. Reason being is because there's, there's two ways, a lot of thermodynamics, energy in, energy out. I either focus on the input or I focus on the output. If the output goes up, if their performance is going up, then the weight will drop, It will the weight will continue to drop because they're exceeding, again, more calories. It is, they're still at a deficit. But if I start off 20 calories because I'm scared that oh, man, we're going to lose all this weight. And this is what fighters do. They do drastic. They go from like 4,000 calories a day to like 2,000. And initially they drop weight. But unfortunately what happens is they don't have that energy. They don't, and, and a lot of them don't have tangibles. Um, for example, if I go into a gym and I, and I go against a white belt, I might feel like I have the best condition in the world. Like, oh, man, I can go all day long. You go against a black belt for three minutes, and you're like, dude, my condition sucks. I can't breathe because there's no tangible there. You know, a lot of these guys do tangible sparring, and that depends on who you're sparring with, how you sleep, with so many, so many different things, right? So, like, I want to make sure that I, I keep this, this, this caloric baseline and monitor, like, okay, are, are you getting leaner? Because a lot of times the weight won't drop initially but they'll be leaning out and that'll help me with the weight cut because muscle is mostly water so the more muscle you have the more weight that we can actually cut whereas fat you can sit in a sauna all you want but you're not losing fat in the sauna you know and it's very hard you're not getting water from fat fat is you know fat's hydrophobic it doesn't attach to that water so like i said a lot of these fighters they cut these calories their performance declines so the only way for them to lose more weight is to drop calories again and I'm sure, I'm sure as your partner, Mike, will, will, will attest to a lot of these guys, they're, you, you, you just, how much are you eating? And they're like, well, I have an oatmeal in the morning and then I'll have a protein shake after I work out. It's like, and you, you add up the calories, you're going to like 800 to 1200. Yeah. And 
you know, you're sitting there like, dude, you are grinding twice a day. And, you know, like that's not even doing your workout. Um, and again, it just goes back to that basic principle. Concentrate on increasing performance, the weight will take care of itself. You concentrate on the weight, that performance will decline. Yeah, no, that, that is a, a big part of it. And, um, you know, I, I, I tell all my guys right now, um, you know, especially as we get about a, a month out, I'm like, look, we got a month. It needs to be fight camp, not fat camp. So we need to spend <laughs> the next three weeks. We need to spend the next three weeks dialing in and optimizing, not scrambling to lose as much weight as possible. And that's where I think a lot of people, they throw their entire camp out of the, you know, they throw their entire camp in the trash because they, they do everything right. And then they, they're very reactive with their weight cut or their weight in general. And then it's a, it's a mad dash. And they're like, I made weight. I'm good. I'm like, well, yeah, you made weight, but you didn't make weight optimally. And there's a huge difference because look, starving yourself is very, very different than manipulating water content and then rehydrating for performance purposes. But so many people just think, well, if I make weight, it's good. And <laughs> that is clearly not you know, not just it, because I know a lot of skinny people that can't step into a cage, but so let me ask you this, uh, you know, how much, how much of the weight cutting is nutrition based and how much of it is, uh, training based? Oh God, I'd say 99.9% of it is nutrition based and, and that, I would say 95% because so when you, when you start a cut, you know, like I'm a numbers guy, to lose one pound, you know that you have to be in a deficit of 3,500 calories. And I try to tell this with the fighters. Let's say you had, you know, I know this is going to sound crazy to the average person, but a 10-pound cut is like a burp and a hiccup in the UFC. You know what I mean? If you have 10 pounds to cut the week of the fight, these guys are screaming for joy. But let's just say you had a 10-pound cut. That means you would have to be in a deficit of 35,000 calories. Nobody eats 35,000 calories. So let's say you did eat in all the week of the fight, you still wouldn't make weight because you're not at that much of a deficit. A cut, the difference between weight loss and weight cut, weight loss, you're losing body fat. You're trying to lose as much body fat as possible. A weight cut, it's all water that you're losing. And if I'm trying to work out to lose that, number one, working out causes inflammation and it also causes your, your muscles to, to pull water in. So if you're going hard in the paint, you're actually kind of working against everything that that uh, you you're, you're trying to do. Uh, a lot of guys, you know, they cut carbs out, they cut salt out before the actual weight cut, so they fill up the week, and you're like, bro, there's nothing left to cut. You know what I mean? That's what cut costs. You know, that's that's salt, carbs, and the last thing you have is water. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's a I think on a baseline. That's yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about that. This whole show is just nothing but tangents, George. We didn't have tangents, we'd have okay. a show. <laughs> I, appreciate, I got ADHD or whatever you call it. I'm like all over the place. All right. So um, you know, I tell people the best way to to, to get lean is is don't get fat in the first place. Um, so <laughs> if we're if we're talking about like a timeline in preparation for a fight camp. Like what are, you already kind of talked about some of the, the expectations, but like, what's the ideal kind of timing for weight loss? And if you could map it out perfectly. For, for weight loss. I mean, obviously the, the longer we have, the better, you know, because when you lose slowly, you lose less muscle than you do fat. Um, in a perfect world, I get about eight weeks, you know, right now I'm with Tyson. We have 12 weeks. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nice long stretch. So it's a, it's a nice, nice, slow weight loss. You know, it's a nice progression where we can work on performance, just increasing performance. And like I said, keeping those, those calories up, um, as you get closer to the fight, you know, you gotta, gotta balance. Okay. What's more, what's more of an issue here? Is it the performance or is it the, is the weight loss? But to answer your question, we start off about eight weeks. I take a, I, I look at their activity levels. I look at their their goals, what their current weight is, what they have to be, what size cut they can they can deal with with the amount of muscle mass that they have. And then uh, you just kind of backtrack from there. You break it down per week how much weight they have to lose. Um, and then that will, that will determine. Obviously, uh, you don't want to start cut, cutting the calories, but like I said, as you get closer to a fight, if you got a guy, and this has happened tons of times, Eric, I have a guy, 
on a fight at 155, you know, they're 210 pounds, you know, you got five weeks out, you know, you'd be like, you know, in a perfect world, I'd like to be like, yeah, Eric, we're going to lose two to three pounds per week, you know, then at that point, you got like a 50 pound guy that ain't out you, you know, so um, it is it is a balance, you have to sit there and, and kind of look at each situation, um, but a perfect situation, two pounds per week, eight weeks, um, let's say they're a 175 or up, 15 pound weight cut um, at, at, a, at a maximum. And, uh, you know, perfect cut would be like 10 pounds. Um, like I said, it is a necessary evil because, you know, a lot of people would think, like, whoa, well, if they died in and just woke up on weight, that would be really good. In the world of boxing, I think that's, that, that, that's uh, acceptable. But in MMA, because you're pushing, you know, weight moves weight. And if a guy's 15, 20 pounds heavier than you, that has, it's a huge advantage that that individual has. If they, you know, and that, that goes if they did a proper cut and they also did a proper rehydration, which we, you know, I always preach, is, is more important than the actual cut itself. Yeah, I mean, some of these guys are monsters. I see, uh, you know, so a lot of the guys that I work with are smaller, 35ers and 45ers. And you see, like, uh, you know, I'll show a guy like him, like, uh, you know, he he's people don't realize he's 135 for about three minutes. <laughs> and then he's right. and then he's and then he's back up to his normal weight. That's the thing people don't realize is like the weight that you fight at, you are literally at for like under five minutes because yes. the goal is to get it done, to weigh and then fill back up. And it's just like <laughs> It's, people don't realize that it's like it's literally like a half a second and you look at the size of some of these guys because aljo was just in town for the boston card and a lot of my a lot of my guys were sparring with him like that guy's a big boy and i'm like yeah he's got a lot of muscle but you know um he's super super lean and and uh you know i i don't i don't know you know how much he cuts but i have a feeling it's a, a probably a slightly bigger number than a lot of the others but he also is a lot more muscular as well so that's uh you know it, it's just crazy to see what people can cut so um so before you jump before you jump ahead mike for the uninformed like for someone listening who's who's not in it like you guys give me some examples of like what a swing would be so like i weigh in you know day before day of fight at x weight how much heavier would they actually be when the lights go on in the cage well uh, a perfect cut and rehydration so monday is usually when you're prepping for the cut tuesdays when you actually start cutting stuff if you do a proper, everything goes well, the rehydration, you'll be the exact way that you were Monday morning, Saturday, Saturday morning, the day of the fight. So if you're, you know, and so that's usually like a 155er, probably about 172, 170 to 172. Um, he'll cut weight, weight 155, and then be 172 pounds Saturday morning. Got it. Yeah, it's 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 a crazy my my guys, my 35ers end up, you know, depending getting back into the cage about 49, 50, um, just depending on the individual and, and how much they can fill up. So um, so let me ask you this, uh, you know, talk a little bit about how much focus is on hitting, you know, specific macronutrients, uh, the quality of food, you know, sort of are there sort of do's and don'ts of foods that they should maybe stay away from, but also talking about that versus just hitting a calorie goal because you know a thousand calories can be made up a few different ways so how important are our sort of finding the sweet spot for macros etc yeah that's, that's good. So macros um so i've been working with uh, joseph parker for for a while now and i've been doing the strength and condition and everything as well um and we had him bulking and i told him bulking um, it was a lot harder than people think. He was like every meal I bring to him, he was like, Oh my god, I gotta eat this. And he was tired of eating. He's like, I never thought this was possible. And he's a heavyweight. I said, Macros are a lot more important. You gotta get the proteins, you gotta get the carbs because your body's using this the only thing that's gonna build muscle is that protein, you know. Fighters, because you're you know, every calorie counts, the micronutrients are extremely important. And they're not really high in calories. You know, getting the veg in there is extremely, uh, extremely important. So, in terms of, of uh, you know, calculating specific um, uh, micros, I don't. Just to be honest, God on street, I don't. But I, what I do is every every meal, I'm putting garlic, I'm putting tomatoes, I'm putting onion, I'm putting broccoli, spinach, and I just cook it all together. And it's funny, like if anybody is watching this at home. If you put, you know, just put tomatoes in a pot, let them sit there and cook, they'll burst and everything. 
will cook together. Put three teaspoon or tablespoons of rice into that. Like, uh, like I'm talking like a full pot, which would be about four or five cups. And that sucker will look like it's so full of rice. It looks like all rice because it all cooks together. All that, uh, everything cooks together. So I give them a lot more veggies. I mean, that's that's the basis of their, their meals. It fills them up. It gives the micronutrients to them. Um, and in terms of, of, of ratios, they can change a lot. The one thing is, let's say weight becomes an issue. Cutting calories is my last line of defense. It's the last thing I want to do. So one thing I'll do for fighters that aren't dropping weight is I'll increase the, the protein count. Because basically the thermogenic effect of foods, if I, if I eat 100 calories of protein, about 40% of those calories are actually used in the process of burning the, the, the actual protein itself. So if I eat 100 calories of carbs and I eat 100 calories of protein, I'm going to get a different result based on the thermogenic effect of those foods. Um, but again, I'm not, I'm not cutting the calories. Um, I'm just changing the Hey everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guests every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out where you can find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. All right, so next question is talk a little bit about supplements, right? Are there any like staple supplements that are standard or any that you maybe even try to avoid? Yeah, I mean, first off, anything, everything's got to be third-party certified. You know, it it has to be third-party certified. Um, I was working with a company once, and um, they had amino acids. I mean, like, you know, what can you put in amino acids? Uh, they tested it, and yeah, you would come back positive for the amino acids that this company was was selling. So right now, like, I don't. I mean, even if it's something as simple as a protein powder, if it's not third party certified, I don't. I don't get it. I don't mess with it. Um, I actually don't mess with protein powder a whole lot. Uh, you know, BCAs are. Um, it's funny because a lot of people are like, well, BCAs don't do very much, and you know, people are like, well, there's BCAs in protein. Well, the thing is, you you got. You know, I think 22 amino acids in a protein, right? Eight of those, eight or nine of those are essential amino acids, and three of those are are, are the BCAs. You got leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Those go directly to the muscle, right? So if you're not in a in a deficit, if you're not in that, like you're not dropping all this weight, is it very necessary? No. But if when calories count and I need to fuel those muscles and I need I need to uh, prevent a catabolic state, BCAs is a really efficient way to do that. So I'll I'll give about 10, uh, 10 grams of BCAs, five grams intro, five grams post for each workout that, that uh, uh, athletes doing. I also like beta alanine. Uh, beta alanine is great for muscular endurance. There's a lot of studies that are behind it. You know, our body creates carnosine, but if you ingest carnosine, it doesn't stay in the system the same way to digest it. Um, but beta alanine combined with histidine creates the beta, the, the, the carnosine that we need to increase muscular endurance. So, 4,000 milligrams a day, even if you're on days off. Um, if you take it, just, you know, I'm sure you've had the tinglys, you know, you're scratching your face and uh, let you know it's working. Um, another one is uh, baking soda, sodium bicarbonate. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of sodium bicarbonate. I think it's 200 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. They've done studies of 300 milligrams, but I know it's 200, 300 is not a big difference, but the big difference is when you're ingesting that amount of sodium bicarbonate at one time. I'd rather have 200 milligrams per kilogram than 300 because that that's just the worst. I, I've tried. If you guys know any way to take it where it just doesn't taste like absolute dog crap, let me know. But you know, it's it's a buffer. It helps with muscular endurance. Um, obviously, creatine is a big one, but you know, theoretically, creatine. You know, there's a lot of studies, especially with rest, uh, wrestlers. They do a cut, they cut the creatine, and then they do a super load on the creatine, and it's helped out with resting matches, endurance, so on and so forth. I've had a lot of negative effects with, with creatine and fighters, like their arms kind of fill up, and I, you know, I think that could be caused to a pump that it creates. Um, I, I, quite honestly, I'm, I'm not sure, but I would start everybody with creatine. If they have a negative effect, obviously pull them off that. Um, you know, 
CLA. CLA is actually a good, um, it's a fat that basically eats fat. You basically take CLA, studies so that you actually, you know, over the course of six to seven weeks, you lose five pounds, which to the average person isn't a lot. But once you get down to the nitty gritty, I'll take any ounce that I could possibly have with a fighter. But, you know, outside of that, you know, like, I, I, honestly, food, you know, I always tell people supplement, it means to supplement your diet. So if you're eating garbage, you're supplementing garbage. Um, you know, the supplements you come when you find a deficiency with an athlete, you're not getting enough of something, and then you, you incorporate that supplement to supplement the food that you're, that you're giving them. So let me ask you this. Uh, when we talk about hydration, um, can you give us some basic guidelines on how you monitor hydration and how you, tack, uh, how you track hydration in general? Yeah, um, track it. All right, so if I have the pleasure of working with a fighter outside of three days, um, you obviously want to, we want to load them up. You know, you have, you know, there's a lot of fighters do a water load the, the week prior. Basically, we keep it to whatever weight that they have to drop, they have to drink. And that doesn't include what they drink when they work out. So if they have 16 pounds to, to lose, they're drinking two gallons of water a day, so on and so forth. Um, and let's say they have less than eight pounds, we want a minimum of at least a gallon of water a day. Again, not what you lose, uh, what you drink while you're working out. So what you drink while you're working out is completely separate than your overall daily uh, water intake. Um, we, we monitor like, one thing we, you know, one thing we want to look at is like, okay, how much of this is going to be lost? Like their overall weight is going to be lost due to carbohydrates and the water attached to carbohydrates. So every kilogram of lean muscle tissue that your body holds holds under 13 grams of glycogen, and every gram of glycogen holds under three grams of water. So I think it's 453.6 grams of uh, in, in one pound. So if I take the overall water and I take the overall carbohydrate with the amount of lean muscle mass that an individual has, that will give me the overall pound that this individual is going to lose once his carbohydrates are depleted. From that point forward, is it's all water and salt. So that lets me know how much water and sodium I need to, to replenish the fighter with. Um, like I said before, the cut is extremely important, but the, the, the rehydration is 10 times more important. You know, if you miss weight, that's 20% of your purse. If you get your ass kicked uh, because you're dehydrated, that's 50% of your purse. And then that, that doesn't even, you know, include the safety that, you know, your brain, your body. The fact that, you know, if you're 3% dehydrated, that equates to up to 30% decrease in performance. You're going up against a killer at 70%. That's very dangerous. Um, so we're really particular about the rehydration. I think we're real, more known for the rehydration than we are for the cutting. Um, and we, the way we monitor that, like I said, we, we find out how much water this individual holds through carbohydrates, how much the carbohydrates are attached to, and then how much we have to lose through the, the actual water. Um, and then we want to make sure that we, we put that in there, not just with sodium, because you have everything in the body is a balance. You have to have a specific amount of potassium to sodium ratios, um, how your body adjusts it. Like if you adjust it too quickly, then, you know, you'll get osmotic diarrhea. Um, it, it just is, is, a, is a plethora of things. And if you go overboard, which most fighters before the, uh, the IV ban, uh, most fighters were getting two, three saline bags uh, drips uh, right after weighing. A lot of people know, so a saline drip has 9,000 milligrams of sodium chloride. If I get three of them, that's 27,000 milligrams of salt that I'm putting, or sodium chloride that I'm putting in my body. Then they'd get out after they, they took the three bags, and they'd go out, they'd have soup, and they'd have high-salt meals. And they weren't really concentrating on potassium, weren't concentrating on calcium, magnesium, or any of these things that help your muscles relax and help your muscles contract. Um, with, with us, personally, what we do is we, we individually make each, each uh, shake for each person for each, each cut, depending on that water that they have to lose based on what I just told you. All right. So speaking of monitoring, you know, I know from talking to Mike, how insanely stressful the training is preparing for this. And then, and then hearing everything that you're saying, how insanely stressful the, the, uh, the nutrition is like taking a step back globally in terms of what you monitor, how much are you monitoring for the stress and how it's impacting things like 
Are you tracking sleep? Are you tracking HRV, resting heart rate? Kind of talk some a little bit about how you're tracking some of those metrics physiologically to see if you need to dial things up, down, or, or one way or the other. Yeah, and I love that you bring that up. Yeah, it's uh, with Joe, since I'm doing a strength and conditioning, um, you know, like I said, fighters don't have tangibles. So the way that they measure a workout a lot of, I'm not saying all fighters, I, mean, I don't want to generalize. Um, and GSP was one one of the, the pioneers of understanding a lot of these things. Um, you don't have a good workout unless you're dead. You know, a lot of these guys are like balls to the wall and they try to do this six days a week on a, on a deficit of food. Uh, they don't realize, like, again, the, the purpose of fight camp is to get better at fighting. Every, every workout, you should be improving on something. Speed, recovery, cardio, master, cardio, you know, aerobic capacity, whatever it is. Um, but these guys don't have a tangible. They just know fight, 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 fight. And we monitor, like, how do you know you're supposed to have a heart day? We, like, with Joe, he, we check his HRV every morning, you know, and it's like, if everything lines up, and we have a, we have an amazing schedule right now, you know, his intense days, he wakes up in the morning, his HRV is through the roof. Perfect. Boom. Next day, we know it's going to be low, but that, that gives us a general guideline on how hard, how, how, uh, intense each workout should be now the body you know let me always tell people body doesn't understand stress all it knows is stress it doesn't know if you did a two-hour workout yesterday or you're stressed out about your family life you know that stress can, can lower the hrv uh lack of sleep can increase your heart rate you know if you wake up your heart rate's uh, running faster than usual that can be a couple of signs number one overtraining and number two you had a bad bad night of sleep and that'll affect your training throughout that day um I always tell people, like, sometimes you do have to train hard, even if everything isn't perfect, but it's a lot better. It's like, I always, I always tell people, like, could you imagine having a hangover, but not drinking the night before? So, like, when you wake up the next day after a lot of drinking and you feel like crap, you like, feel like crap, but you know why you feel like crap, so that makes it better. It makes it okay. But if you felt like that and you didn't drink, you'd be very stressed out. You'd be like, why do I feel like this? Like, what's going on? Um, the same thing, you know, it's like you're, you're not hitting the numbers that you usually would hit, but it's like, hey man, you didn't get a good night's sleep last night. You got a lot in your mind. You got a lot in your plate right now. You're stressed about X, Y, and Z. That helps calm the fight it out. The psychological aspects of nutrition performance um, are just as important as the physiological side of things, you know, but yeah, to ask you a question again, I went on a tangent. Uh, HRV, we, do, we take the heart rate, HRV, I monitor the weight every night, every morning. Um, you know, if you, let's say, on average, a fighter will, if they drink enough water, if they drink the same amount of water every day, they'll typically float the same based on the day. For example, if you did, uh, let's say you did a very hard lifting session, you're not going to float as much as, as you did on an off day. So you can't go day to day. You got to go by the days of activity. So last day he did heavy workout. He floated three pounds. Um, and on average, he floats about three pounds. But then let's say one day he floats a pound. He drank the same amount of water, did the same workout. That could tell me a lot of different things. He's holding inflammation. Uh, his body's getting overworked or he might be getting sick. And, you know, so that, that tells me to kind of back off of things, you know, let things slide and um, give him, give him a, a lower day or maybe an active recovery. All right. So you, a lot of gold in what you just said right there. So a couple of things that I'm thinking about is one is, yeah, that the psychological aspect and getting them to buy in and get convinced, like a lot of things that you need to train. And Mike and I have had these discussions, like you need to train to be explosive. And as you said, speed and power. But like we talk about when we teach our course on programming that like you can't get explosive and fast and powerful and tired at the same time. They're just contradictory physiologically. So you shouldn't walk away from an explosive workout feeling like you had a lot more in the tank, but that's tough to sell to guys like you're talking about who have that mindset that it's not a workout unless I'm, unless I'm face down on the ground. Um, and then the other component is you're like right. the average, like the average person, you know, you know, their biggest fear is, Oh no, I don't want to put on too much muscle. And it's like, dude, you know, I've been trying to last 30 years to put on too much muscle. I wish it was that easy. Like you don't worry. You're not going to walk. Right. You're not going to walk in tomorrow and win the Mr. Olympia, but for your, your population, that is a concern. Like, so talking about managing the training where you may have people with different levels of, 
of uh, receptiveness physiologically to, to strength training and how you got to be super careful that you don't put on too much muscle that's going to end up being harder to, to, to make weight for at some point. Yeah, no, you're you're 100 percent right. Um, and you know, we talk about explosiveness. You know, in terms of reps, you know, you have, you, and and this is a, this is a very generalized thing. People, you know, they live by it, but it's not necessarily the truth because, you know, hypertrophy takes place anywhere from eight to twelve repetitions. Power one to three. Strength around five five repetitions. I know a lot of guys just put on a lot of size doing five sets of five. You know, um, not so much during the eight to twelve range. But that's a, that's just kind of like a general guideline. If we're working power, I always tell people like power, or no, sorry, strength. Working strength, I'm like strength is your body's ability to recruit those muscle fibers, the amount of muscle fibers that your body has to recruit from. Power is being able to 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 to, to pull them in very quickly. Like benches, you start off with the bench, and say we start 10, 20, 30, 40. Your body's recruiting these things at a different rate. But if I tell you to jump onto a box, you know you can't do it very slowly. You have to go zero to a hundred. Um, Doing this with with lighter athletes, people that are sitting at a specific um, a specific weight class, you know, I I try to do all the strength training off season between fights. A lot of a lot of strength conditioning coaches they try to do it during the actual fight camp. You know, they're trying to smoke these guys. It's like you only have so many buckets that you have of energy. You know, what I'm saying they're wasting their energy on strength and conditioning when they should be doing. Um, you know, MMA, they should be actually doing sports specific stuff. Off season, you know, like you said, it takes a lot. And, and an MMA fighter, if they're fighting three times a year, you don't have time to put on the kind of muscle. And if you do, let's say you put on, let's say even three pounds. Three pounds is a lot of muscle because you got to remember when you look at weight, it, three pounds of muscle, you're, you're looking a lot more because you're looking at the carbs and you're looking at the water tax now. So in essence, you're going to gain probably seven to eight pounds, but in true form, you may be gaining three pounds of lean muscle tissue. A lot of people don't know that. Like, when you go get your lean body mass, a lot of people are going to look at it like 200 pounds, you're 10% body fat. They're like, I'm 180 pounds of muscle. And they're like, no, we're only about 40% of that is actual lean muscle tissue. So when you look at a, a big guy at 10% body fat, 200 pounds and 10% is a pretty lean freaking guy. You know, when you look at, I mean, 40%. Of 180, you probably look at 70 pounds. 70 pounds. This guy's, you know, he's a beast, 70 pounds. To add on to that, you know, you're not going to be going from 70 to 80 pounds in one to two months. So um, I don't think it's a, it's a real big issue. If you, you know, like I say, you look at the ranges. I want to try and build a base for strength, as you guys taught me. Baseline movement exercises, you know, push, pull, overhead, squat, lunge. You know, we work on those basics, get as much shake as we can. I'm really big about the core. The core is something I think that people uh, in the MMA community negate so badly. Like, they're like, let's work core. And they, they go and do like a million crunches. And you're like, oh, for the love of God, you know, like it's not stabilizing anything. Um, and the core, I'll work throughout the entire fight camp. But like I said, one or two months, we do the strength condition. Not enough time to put on the, the, the kind of muscle that would have any any repercussions because that muscle is going to eat fat. Nothing burns calories like muscle. You're just going to get a leaner fighter. Now, you get guys like, um, what is that kid's name? He was like a super saiyan. He was, um, what, what the heck? Northcutt, Sage Northcutt? Yeah, Northcutt. Yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, that guy you might have to look out for. But unless somebody is that lean in, that, in terms of body fat percentage, I honestly don't think that's a, that's a real big issue because like I said, the adding of muscle takes care of the losing of fat, and uh, it kind of balances it out. And the cool thing is that muscle holds on to a lot of water, which, again, we can cut during the actual uh, fight camp. Yeah, which is, you know what, the, the one thing I just want to sort of add as we start to get to the tail end of this, a lot of people, it, it'll be interesting because a lot of people, especially guys that maybe haven't lifted a lot and they start to see that they're getting bigger, they get worried. But then they weigh themselves, and they're like, wait a minute, like, I, I look bigger, my clothes <laughs> are fitting differently, but I'm actually, like you said before, a little bit leaner. And a lot of the times they get freaked out, but then they have their cut and they realize, wow, the weight just flies off because all we did was give them a little bit of muscle and, and they look exponentially different um, uh, based off of, you know, uh, you know, sort of the cut and, and how we ran their camp. Because I've had, you know, when you work with the same fighter for 10, 
11 years, you can kind of see how their body changes fight to fight and over the course of uh, over the course of decades. And the one thing that I've noticed is that when we have had the 10, 12 weeks to spend a little bit of time at the beginning, first four to five weeks, just working on, you know, build muscle, not a ton. Like you said, if you can get a couple pounds, you're, you're killing it. Um, and then go from there. Those first four weeks laying the foundation, not only from a GPP standpoint is, is, is fantastic, but from a, uh, from a hypertrophy standpoint, you got an extra month and um, it never hurts to put a little bit of extra on at the beginning of the phase. And I like to actually take that same approach post fight after they have a couple of weeks to, you know, um, let their body heal up. It's like, yeah, we're going to go right back into a hypertrophy phase for a little bit. If we have time, because you need to put some of that muscle back on because you did lose muscle in the process. And a lot of people don't understand that. Amen. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, so, and I'm sure it doesn't hurt looking good coming off the bus, right? A little bit of intimidation factor. You know? <laughs> so, and I, and I love that both of you guys are talking about when you're talking about training fighters and, and this is goes across any sport really is that a lot of the stuff you're talking about on the strength and conditioning side, it doesn't have to look like fighting. You know what I mean? Like uh, people automatically assume that, oh, they're fighters. We need to make everything kind of look like what they're going to encounter. And it's like, they look, they get enough of that on the mat. They get enough of that in the ring. I don't need to replace that. They, they, they're going to, I need to, to build, like you said, those foundations. I need to make sure they move well. I need to make sure that they got mobile ankles, hips, and, and trunk. I need to make sure that they have good, good movement and strength and all these different patterns and then let the MMA take care of itself. Amen. You're hundred yeah. percent right. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, it's funny, Eric. I will tell you, they go, me and Joe talk a lot and uh, he's loving it because he's, he's seeing these tangibles, strength increasing, endurance increasing with basics is fundamentals, but it's, it's consistency, simplicity, and uh, but the, the thing about it is, is it's not sexy. And I see a lot of these trainers nowadays, you know, and again, I'm not speaking bad about anybody because there's disease, but a lot of these trainers are trying to make the you're like what in God's green earth, like they'll be on an upside down BOSU ball with a band and one, you know, like it, it looks like they're like a part of the rubber band game and things shaking. And you know, it's like I have no idea what the hell they're doing here now, but um, you're 100% right, the fundamentals build that foundation, build that movement. And then the sport specific stuff, that's where they, they, uh, they apply everything and they have the energy to do it. Yeah. Love it. That's, that's just fitness porn for clicks, George. That's what they're doing. <laughs> straight, straight. All right. So we were talking a little bit before we got on, because uh, you're calling us from England today. And so we're, that's why we've been trying to nail down this, this time for recording for, for months now. So <laughs> grass, no grass grows under George. He's everywhere. He told me he's been home seven days this year. Total. So, um, tell me like, <laughs> what's on the horizon for 2023 with whether it's on the education side or, or, or new stuff that you're working on, what's, what's kind of new and exciting in your world? Man. So right now I'm you know, working with Joseph Parker. I'm working with Tyson Fury. So uh, Tyson is fighting uh, Nangano in Saudi Arabia on the 25th of October. Same as Joseph. Um, so you know, right now I'm, we, we started 12, we're 12 weeks out. So I think we've got about nine weeks to go. Um, after that, we're either flying to Ireland for another fight that will take place uh, early December or another one that'll be in late December in Saudi Arabia. Nothing's been, you know, the one thing about fights, it takes a while to, you know, click a man, but we have a, we have a lot that are scheduled. So, um, well, it'll be in Ireland or, or like I said, in, in Saudi, but, um, in terms of education, you know, I have the online, uh, the weight cut certification that we, you know, that I have out there now and, um. You know, there's a lot of people that are that are that are doing it. They're they're getting certified. There's so many people that uh, they need help. Being with somebody is completely different. I know as, as you guys, you know, you guys are hands on with all these people, and it, it's like someone's like, "Well, just give me a, a a program, give me a workout program." It's a lot different when you're there, being like, "Hey, you need to tighten this, you need to move this forward, your back's not straight." It's it's a, it's a completely different animal. This is, which is why I don't like sending out programs anymore. Because um, I can't judge the intensity. If they need to go up, they need to go down. They need to, you know, a lot of different things. So I created the certification to, to, to send people out. And I actually, um, one of my sources out with Tommy Fury right now. Um, you know, we have one with uh, Conor McGregor. You know, uh, Devin Haney, Jake Paul. 
you know, so we're, we're, we're expanding to make sure you just make sure that everybody has hands on because weight cut is not something that you can tell a fighter, teach them how to do it and they can do it themselves. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I'm going to be, be in Saudi and after that it's either Ireland or, or back to England at the end of the year. Awesome. So before we wrap up, Mike, anything you want to throw in uh, last minute here? Uh-oh. No, I mean, uh, I I feel like if him and I keep going, we're going to be here till midnight, but he's probably going to get some rest. So, uh, no, thank you so much, man. It, it's good to talk shop with someone who's been doing this a long time like myself. And, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully we cross paths someday. It'll probably be at an event or at the PI or something. So, um, yes. it's, uh, yeah, it's always good to chat with you. So thank you so much. It's uh, It's been awesome. And, uh, Eric, I'll let you finish this up, buddy. Yeah, we definitely are gonna we gotta have a lot less years between this one and the next one like we did last time. Sure. So it was awesome catching up. Best of luck with everything. We want to thank you for coming on. Greatly appreciate you and what you're doing. And we want to thank you also for listening. And this has been the Principles of Performance Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance Podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube. Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the principles of program design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.